Welcome to the Advanced Headphone Measurement Webinar. My name is Steve Temme, and I'm going to be talking about what to measure and what does it mean. All right, welcome. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm Steve Temme, the president of Listen. I'm going to be talking for the next hour. And to keep us all on schedule, uh, all the attendees will be muted. Questions will be answered in chat. As you can see to the right here, there's a little chat screen that you can access. Support engineers Eaton, Will, Lisa, and Alan will be there to answer your questions. Make sure to send to organizers only. Digital slides will be available for download after completing the survey at the conclusion. And I will open the floor to answer questions as well. So previously, when I talked about measuring headphone basics, I talked about how a headphone works, how to measure headphones, different types of headphones, ear simulators. I talked about acoustic test environments, critical measurements like corrected frequency response. And then the last thing I said I was going to talk about in the next session was future topics. And that's what we're here for today. So in this part, I'm going to present and uh, talk about future development of smart headphones, headsets, earbuds, and hearables, measurement standards, measurements using sound check, including USB, Bluetooth, including true wireless stereo headphones, typically referred to as TWS, microphone and send performance of the headphone, voice activation and open loop measurements, and active noise cancellation, which is becoming quite a bit more popular. And then different ways to measure distortion, including non-coherent distortion. And last, I will talk about high-resolution headphones and how to measure those. What is a hearable? So smart headphones or hearables are designed not only to play back music, but to also enhance communications, hearing assistance, minimize background noise, real-time translation, augmented reality, medical monitoring, and fitness tracking, just to name a few. This presentation focuses on how to measure their audio performance only. So what makes testing hearables difficult? They respond to voice commands such as, hey Siri, what time is it? Alexa, tell me a joke. OK Google, what is the weather? They all have wireless interfaces either Bluetooth or and Wi-Fi. Um, they typically have multiple microphones and at least two speakers for left and right earphone. And generally speaking, they have a lot of complex signal processing, such as voice activity detectors, microarray beamforming, automatic ear detection, loudness control, equalization, and compressors, and typically are required to be connected to a smartphone app in order to control these different settings. Hearables are notoriously complex to test as a result of all these intricacies. So standards. I always like to recommend that people follow standards when possible. Um, there are some standards which are a good starting point, but which will not cover everything. Some of them are the IC60268 for sound system equipment, part seven, headphones and earphones. There's also a EN standard that came out of um, England, which deals with how to measure maximum SPL to prevent hearing loss. NCS 3.22, which deals with hearing aid characteristics. And TIA 920, which deals with telecommunications and product transmission. So these hearables apply to all of these things because now they can do so much more than just playback music. Listen sells a complete measurement suite to test to all these different standards. And hopefully, if a new one comes out, we'll be there to support it. So what are the test strategies? So first of all, some headphones still have wires, analog. And if it is available, I strongly recommend you start there and make a more or less a simpler measurement. Um, and very often, it will be on the big circumoral headphones. Bluetooth. More and more um, headphones, headsets have Bluetooth. And it's always a good idea to compare the Bluetooth measurements to the wired, if possible, as a reference. Uh, more and more headphones are voice activated. 
Um, so you control these hearables just like you would the smartphone by saying, hey Siri, Alexa, or hello Google. And typically Apple AirPods is a good example of this. And then last but not least, there's almost always a smartphone app and that adjusts the control for how much noise reduction, might even control microphone directionality, bass and treble for sure, and even possibly hearing assistance. So the test configuration for basic wired and wireless uh, headset measurements consists of two ER simulators, a mouse simulator, an audio interface, and a Bluetooth interface. Today I'm going to be using the B&K hats that has the mouse simulator built in, as well as the ear simulators for left and right ear built in. So in order to make a Bluetooth measurement, I need to calibrate a Bluetooth interface. And our partner Portland Tool and Die makes two of them. One is called the BTC4149, which is ideally suited for R&D, and the BQC4149 for QC, which is what I'll be using today. The advantage of the BTC is it can act as both a Bluetooth sync and Bluetooth source. So not only can it measure headsets and speakers and car kits, but it also can talk directly to Bluetooth devices such as smartphones and infotainment head units. It also has a wider variety of codecs, such as uh, not just A2DP, but also APTX, as well as uh, HD and low latency. Whereas the BQC 4149 is only a Bluetooth sync and can only do A2DP as well as SBC. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate how to measure a pair of AirPod Pros over Bluetooth. And for that, I've loaded up a sequence and sound check for Bluetooth headphones and headsets. And it's really quite simple. All I'm going to do is hit start. It's going to ask me if I want to pair the headphones. I'm going to say yes, but before I do that, I want to put the Bluetooth headphones in pairing mode, which on the back of the AirPods, I push this button until the light flashes white. Now it's in pairing mode. I hit enter, and the BQC will start looking for all the Bluetooth devices in the immediate vicinity, and then I can choose which one I want to pair to. If I know the MAC address, I can do this automatically, such as on a production line. But this is more typical of an R&D situation. So I choose the AirPod Pro, and you'll notice that when I hit OK, the green light should come on, indicating that it's paired. So now I have the option to put the headphones on the ear simulator and press Enter. So I'll go do that. Get the right ear, and in a moment I will check my seal to make sure I have a good seal, and hopefully it stays in. There we go. And then it prompts me if I want to check my headphone seal, which is really important if you're going to measure low frequencies. So now we can see I'm playing pink noise for both the left and the right ear. And I'm getting an overall level of 88 dB SPL on the left ear and about the same on the right ear. I've actually done a good job of the seal because you can see now in the, both the real-time analyzer for the left ear and the right ear that they look pretty similar. Just to give you an example, if I decrease the uh, seal on the right ear, we'll see a lot of the low frequencies disappear. So you can see now how they're going down. So that's no good. I want to get a good seal, and it should really match pretty well to the left ear as well. So it's going to take a second. It indicates that I had an overload. That's no problem. I can just turn that off, both over here. And now we're in business to continue. So now it's going to do a swept sign 12th octave response from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And it's going to show me 
both the left and right ear response as well as a diffuse field corrected response for the left. This I talked about in my previous seminar. And then it's going to show the difference between left and right ear as well as the distortion for left and right ear. So we can see that we have a good uh, measurement for both left and right. In fact, they're tracking pretty well. A little difference at the low frequency, so maybe I didn't get the seal quite as good as I had initially. And I can also see the THD for the left and right ear, as well as the overall sensitivity. And it asks me now, do I want to measure the headphones microphones? So each microphone, I'm sorry, each earphone has a microphone. So I go yes. So now we can see, I just measured the send performance of the microphone in a Bluetooth headset. I'm only showing the left microphone, but you can see that it's fairly smooth. Of course, there's some reflections just due to the fact that the distance from the mouth to the ear could be a reflection off the shoulder, could even be some reflections off the uh, pinna. But all in all, it looks pretty good. And down here, I can also see what the sensitivity is of the microphone in dB relative to um, full scale. There's also an interesting output down here that tells me what is the delay um, between the measurement and the earphone. And if I didn't have my earphones positioned in the same depth, I would get a different delay. But we can see here that it's actually um, pretty darn close. In fact, I get it within 312.9 milliseconds for both left and right ear. So more than likely, I'm going to get good stereo imaging. One thing I really want to emphasize is the importance of comparing the left to the right earphone to see if we're going to get good stereo balance and good imaging. And generally what we do is we just divide the response of the left ear from the right ear, and we get ideally a difference of 0 degrees and 0 dB. If we have a perfect headphone, of course, it would be a flat, smooth line. The most important region, though, for stereo imaging is in the mid-range. So generally, we really want to make sure that, say, from 800 to 5 kilohertz, it's as smooth and as flat and as close to zero as possible. We can also, just as a reminder, I mentioned this last time in Headphones Basic 101 is we may also have a target response. It could be a standardized one, like the diffuse field correction curve, or it could be one that you've created yourself or you use from, for example, the well-known Harman target curve. And from that, we can also try to derive some sort of predicted preference and some scoring mechanism. If you want to know more about that, please go um, watch the first webinar on headphone basics. So now let's talk about the test configuration for hearable measurements using voice activation and a smartphone app. So obviously we're going to need a smartphone that can directly communicate to the hearable or smart headphone, typically via Bluetooth. Sometimes it could be via a lightning connector or USB connector. But in order to control the smartphone, we actually have to have a cloud connection. And this is how we're going to pass our test signal that we've uploaded to the cloud that's going to be played back over the hearable. So it's going to go via the smartphone. And it's actually going to work in both directions, both in the send and the receive. The other thing is typically we need a head and torso simulator, or at least ear simulators that have um, artificial pinnas or a way for us to put the earbuds into the ear simulator. And then, of course, we're going to have sound check connected to the audio interface, which is picking up the acoustic signal analog from the ear simulators and also driving the mouth simulator. So it's a bit more complex than just a typical wired headphone measurement. So how do we test via voice interaction? So first, we want to control the device under test via voice commands. Typically, these are automated testing possible recording and playback via voice commands. This means that we've got to take our test signal from soundcheck and load it as a music track. Each voice service has its own music playback system with different capabilities such as Apple iTunes and Amazon Music. And there's a chance that 
the signal will get compressed when we upload it to the music service. So it might be a good idea to double check the actual recording and download it and compare it to the original WAV file. We can do that using transfer function. And if we want to retrieve a recorded response, we want to use a service that allows us to either download or play back the recording that the actual hearable or smart headphone picked up on. So by design, many smart headphones do not provide the ability to retrieve your voice from the command history. Companies like Apple have decided that that's a privacy issue, so you cannot use iTunes to download voice recordings. Voice interaction speaker measurement steps. So how does this work? The first thing is we create an activation phrase such as Alexa, play test signal one. Then we upload our test stimulus to the cloud service. And as I mentioned earlier, the example is that um, we take a WAV file and we may have to convert it to an MP3 file. So the transparency of the MP3 was tested by encoding and decoding the file and comparing them using the transfer function. And then we want to play the activation word via mouse simulator and capture response with the reference microphone. This is what it sounds like. Test signal one. Playing test signal one from your library. So now that we've played the activation word and we've captured the response, on the reference microphone from the uh, hearable. We can then analyze the captured response signal just as if we had done it real time with a simultaneous play and record. So in order for this to make more sense, we have to dive a little deeper into the details of what does open loop mean, open loop measurements. And then we got to consider resampling and frequency shifting as well as triggering and windowing. And we may want to also uh, have a system step to convert the WAV file or even to control the device under test. So closed loop versus open loop. Basically, up until recently, most of our devices were analog. And as a result, we were able to actually test the device under test just with the same analog input and output of the audio interface. So if it was a microphone, we just played a recording out of the mouse simulator and it simultaneously measured it with the, uh, the microphone going back into the same audio interface. Nowadays, where we're introducing basically the internet as part of the uh, measurement chain, we now have to go through some sort of cloud or um, internet connection. And as a result, it's what we call open loop because we have no control over the exact timing of the playback and record. So in a closed looped audio test, we generally have input and output are the same domain, typically analog. We also have what we call synchronous um, recording where playback and record are controlled at the same time. In an open loop audio test, input and output are not directly connected. In other words, we have not just an audio interface and mouse simulator, but we have a microphone and a WAV file that we have to upload into the cloud and then play back. As a result, the input and output may be in different uh, domains, analog in, in, digital out, or analog out and digital in. Also, the input and output are not synchronous because of a variety of reasons. The biggest one being the sampling rates are never exactly the same. And then we also have a variable delay between input and output. We have no way of knowing how long it's going to take for the uh, voice service to respond and actually play back that particular music track with your test signal that you've requested. And it's highly dependent on internet speed and uh, bandwidth. So the nice thing about sound check is we're able to decouple the stimulus from the response. 
Soundcheck actually does not care if they're done at the same time. We can create that stimulus signal and store it in memory, and then we can upload it to the cloud to play back, and then we can use something like a trigger record to capture the response, and then re um, synchronize both the stimulus and response after the fact. So once we've done that, it's as if we had done a usual um, play and record acquisition, and we can calculate things like frequency response, THD, perceptual robe and buzz, so on and so forth. So when we're doing open loop testing, we almost always have different sampling rates. This is due to the fact that our device under test and our audio interface are using two different crystal clocks. There is no way to synchronize them via master clock. We basically just have to accept the way they are and then try to correct for it. So as a result, they will never produce exactly the same frequency. And uncorrected, this um, will lead to measurement errors, in particular phase measurement errors, and in particular high frequencies where the wavelengths are short. So on the graph on the right, you can see we have an input and output signal. So this could be the stimulus as well as the response signal. And because they're not exactly the same sampling rate, you'll see they have slightly different total times. And our goal is to try to um, shrink one to the other or expand one to the other in order to make a really fair comparison. And the way we do this is by using what's called post-processing and sound check with a resampling and frequency shift which realigns the waveforms in the time domain to correct for this error. So how does frequency shift work? Well, it calculates the true center frequency using a curve fit. And the way the curve fit works is we know the stimulus had a particular frequency, for example, one kilohertz. But we notice when we do the curve fit of the response signal, the playback signal, it's slightly off. It's, for example, 1.01 kilohertz. And if we zoom in, we can see that they're not totally aligned. So the way we are able to correct for this is first determine exactly what is the um, true frequency using an, a very high resolution FFT and a curve fit. But it does require that we have a sine wave, a known sine wave that we can use to correct for the sampling rate. So the way we do this is in a stimulus editor, we prepend, for example, one kilohertz um, trigger tone. This could be as little as 250 milliseconds. And this is a way for the system to actually um, provide a solid signal for frequency shift to lock onto. It also can provide a trigger tone for a triggered recording or what we call intersection if it's a post-processing step. By prepending this fixed tone, and this fixed tone doesn't have to be at one kilohertz, it could actually be anywhere in the bandpass of the device under test. If it was a subwoofer, you'd probably have to be lower frequency. If it was a tweeter, it might have to be a higher frequency. But once we've done this, we can actually apply frequency shift to any kind of test signal afterwards. It could be a continuous sign sweep, it could be noise, it could even be speech or even music. So triggering and windowing. So when testing open loop devices, capturing a response waveform can be challenging. The response waveform needs to be isolated from other signals. For example, voice feedback from the device under test. We also want to trigger a record only acquisition Otherwise, we will just measure noise. And windowing can be used to cut out the response waveform from a larger recording, for example, in a microphone test, where we might have a lot of silence or just background noise. So voice interaction microphone measurements have a slightly different steps than the playback. So here we're going to combine the recorded activation word with a frequency sweep, typically, or the test signal equalized at the um, mouse simulator, mouth reference point. So it may look, sound something like this. Alexa. So out of the mouse simulator, it's playing both the activation word as well as the test signal. 
Then the playback stimulus is then downloaded from the cloud service. And depending on the cloud service, we may actually have to stream it uh, directly into SoundCheck. And there are some tools out there, such as Virtual Audio Cable, which is essentially a digital patch panel that allows me to, instead of playing out of the loudspeaker, I can actually play it directly back into SoundCheck. If I can download the recording as a WAV file or some sort of MP3 file, I can then use a recall step inside a sound check and load it and do post-processing inside a sound check. Again, once I have the recording, the response, I can analyze it just as if it were any other um, measurement. So here's the setup for the hearable microphone test. Um, again, slightly different direction, but we now are actually playing signal out of the mouse simulator which is then being recorded by the headset microphone or microphones getting transferred to the smartphone via Bluetooth from the smartphone up into the cloud and then we can download it from the music service onto SoundCheck. If it's streaming we can use virtual audio cable and actually do a trigger record just like in the playback uh, situation. And then of course we have SoundCheck supplying the uh, output signal through the audio interface into the mouse simulator. Again, open loop because of the cloud. All right, as many of you know, noise canceling headphones are becoming really popular. And it's not just over the ear, but also in the ear headphones or hearables. And they can be a little tricky to measure. So in order to measure them, we got to consider three different measurements. First, we want to calibrate our system. So we actually want to measure what we call the unoccluded ear. In other words, we want to calibrate the ear simulator so that we have a known sound pressure level at the ear simulator. And if we're using uh, a sine sweep or even noise, we want to equalize it to be flat at the ear. Then we want to put the headphone on the ear simulator and just measure the passive attenuation. So the active noise cancellation circuit is off. Then last but not least, we want to measure again with the active cancellation switched on. This will allow us to calculate the passive isolation, which is just the passive attenuation minus the unoccluded ear or the reference. Also the active component where we just want to see how much is the active noise cancellation circuit doing. So this is going to be the active cancellation switched on minus the passive attenuation. And then it's also nice to know what is the total noise cancellation, which clearly is going to be measurement 3 minus the reference, because that's going to have both passive and active. All right, so let's talk about a noise canceling headphone test setup. So today I'm going to be using these two flat plate ear couplers and I have a source speaker over here. As you can see in the system diagram, then that's hooked up to my audio interface. And I actually don't need to use Bluetooth in this case because I'm just measuring the um, noise attenuation from the speaker to the ear simulator. And for today I'm just going to use um, actually the right ear. In order to measure the noise cancellation performance of these headphones, I've written a noise canceling headphone sequence. This sequence uses pink noise played out of a source speaker and then measured at the artificial ear. And what I want to see is how much attenuation I get between the external noise and inside the ear coupler. So I start off by first making sure that my playback has been calibrated, in this case 90 dB SPL. So I remove the headphones. And I'm using a one-third octave real-time analyzer just to look at the um, one-third octave noise level. And we can see it's approximately 90 dB. So next I want to measure the uh, passive attenuation 
of these headphones without the noise cancellation circuit on. Again, I'll play pink noise and measure it in one third octave real time. And you can see I'm getting mostly attenuation at the high frequencies, but not at the low frequencies. So now I want to turn the noise canceling circuit on. So I just turn the power here. And it's on. So now I'm going to be measuring both passive and active noise cancellation. So on the top graph, we have, again, the unoccluded ear, which is my reference. We actually have the passive, which is the green curve. And we notice the passive does really well at high frequencies, but of course not very well at low frequencies. And in fact, there's even a little bit of a gain due to the uh, volume inside the uh, headphone. Then when we turn the t noise cancellation circuit on, we're going to see a combination of both the passive and the active. And the active does really well at low frequencies, but actually creates some gain crossing over to the passive. So that's not good, but it's usually a trade-off of the feedback circuit. Then we're going to calculate the attenuation in dB. So if we look at the green curve, that is the passive attenuation again. Um, no, next to no uh, attenuation at the low frequencies, a lot at the high frequencies. We look at the active attenuation um, with the noise canceling circuit on, a lot of attenuation at the low frequencies, 35 dB, but nothing at the high frequencies, and that's by design. And then when we add the two together, we get the blue curve, which is the total attenuation. Again, it's not perfect, but we get roughly from 25 to 30 dB of attenuation. And we can see this in the table over here where we've just done the average of the three, both passive, active, and total. And overall, we're getting about 28 dB of attenuation. Bear in mind, most of these active noise canceling headphones now have an app to control how much cancellation so in this particular example here from New Hira, I actually have a dial in which I can control if I want more or less noise cancellation. And the primary reason for doing this is if we're in a situation where we want to be aware of what's going on in our surroundings, such as walking on the street, we probably don't want to totally block out the traffic noise, but maybe just some of it. If we're on an airplane and the kid's screaming next to you in the seat, you might want to block out as much as possible, so we'll turn it all the way up. Now, it would be really nice if we could simulate real-world conditions, such as the kid screaming in the seat next to you, or you're in a noisy restaurant. And we don't want to have to go make all these in-situ measurements in the real world. We actually want to just capture them, record them, bring them back to the lab, and simulate them. And this can be done using a background noise system a calibrated background noise system such as the one I'm showing you here. There are some standards that specify how this works using binaural recordings and the one that we've implemented is Etsy ES202396 and they have a library of these standard background recordings but you can also go make your own binaural recording and this will allow us to come into the lab and recreate this noise environment so that we can see how the, for example, the active noise cancellation circuit works in real world conditions. We can also use it for measuring things like signal to noise ratio of microphones and beam forming directionality studies of microphones and more. So here's an example of a SNR, signal to noise ratio measurement of a smart headset measured according to the Etsy standard background noise. And in this graph, we can see how much of signal to noise we get with the background noise on. And you can see 20 dB 
at the low frequencies, as much as 30 at the high. And that's okay, that's pretty good. I'd like to see more. But what would concern me is this dip here at around 800 hertz, where I'm only getting 5 dB. So that's not a lot of attenuation. And if there was some particular background noise going on there, it would probably be pretty audible. So test signals are extremely important when testing these type of devices. If it was just a passive transducer, we could always just use a sine wave. But many of these devices will have codecs inside of them, which are de um, designed to suppress things like sine waves. Normally, if we sweep fast enough, the codec will not keep up. But still, it's good to test under real-world uh, conditions. Other things such as microphone signal processing may be biased towards speech um, or using noise canceling algorithms, speech activity detectors, and that precludes testing with sine waves. Broadband test signals like pink noise allow viewing real-time changes when controls are changed. So I can actually measure the active noise cancellation real-time, which is pretty neat if you want to see how a quick the circuit is to respond to changes in the environment, the noise in the environment you're in. So what is so special about sine waves? Well, sine waves are still easy to calibrate. It's also um, easy to measure harmonic distortion. And generally speaking, they will give us the best signal to noise ratio for any of our tests. But the reality is we also want to see how the device behaves under real operating conditions, realistic customer use cases. So signal processing inside of smart devices are designed to interact with voice and play music. So we want to deal with voice activity detectors, microarray beamforming. We might need to sense the acoustic environment and loudness control. All these factors will influence how the device performs under real world conditions. And we want to measure that. So we have to take into consideration how we're going to calibrate testing or making measurements where we're using things like speech, non-standardized speech, and also how are we going to measure playback level if we're trying to listen to things like music or speech. So we have something called active speech level for calibrating the uh, speech playback and Zwicker loudness for actually measuring uh, complex level playback. And inside of Soundcheck, we do this by um, offering both a post-processing algorithm where we take the speech signal and it takes into account the silent gaps so that we can exclude them from the overall level. And this is because different people, different dialects, different languages will actually have different uh, silence between utterances. Also, we have to take in consideration that we can have different time constants. Um, and think of it as a attack and release time. My favorite is hangover time, which actually allows for um, longer silent gaps between active speech sections to be ignored. And there's even something called margin, so that we can have a threshold, essentially an activity um, threshold level. And if we use the active speech level of the WAV file, we can also set that in the stimulus editor. The other algorithm we have is Zwicker loudness. And this will calculate the overall perceived loudness that a human would perceive when listening to complex signals. So it uses a, a psychoacoustic model, which takes into account the nonlinearity of human hearing and sound at different frequencies and levels. So the ear does not act like a simple sound level meter. It is actually quite a bit more complex, and we need to be able to represent the perceived level to different things such as music. And that is another post-processing algorithm inside a sound check that we can use to calculate the, for example, how many fawns is the loudness of the playback system. So very often, we can't use sine waves to test these devices, but we still want to know what is the distortion. And this requires using different techniques. One of them is called non-coherence. 
So non-coherent distortion is basically a normalized cross-correlation measurement that determines the degree to which the system output is linearly related to the system input. And the two things that will affect the linearity is noise and distortion. So if we can make a measurement with a good signal-to-noise ratio, we'll be assured that the non-coherence is due only to distortion. If you'd like more information, there's an AES paper that um, we presented back in 1987. I forget. <laughs> um, so how does a non-coherent distortion measurement work? Well, first of all, if we're going to use music and do some subjective listening test, we want to calibrate our playback system. In order to do this, we use um, a head and torso simulator, or a binaural head and torso simulator, and we take our recorded musical excerpts and we actually play it over the headphones that we want to use for comparison and use that recording to then play back over a pair of very high-end headphones with low distortion. In order to do this, we want all the headphones to have the same equalized frequency response. And if we post-process the recording so that they all have the same target response, such as a Harman target, and listen to the recordings on the reference headphones, the only difference we should hear between headphone A, B, and C should be distortion. And this is what we did. Um, in fact, we did this for an AES paper with Harmon and Sean Olive's group. And we looked at the non-coherent distortion for um, three over-the-ear headphones of high quality, um, four actually, and we also had our reference headphone. And you can see that the, uh, the green distortion measurement is quite a bit lower than the other uh, four. And that was the reference headphone. So that's what you know, we would expect. And we can also see that headphone D, the orange curve, had particularly more non-coherent distortion than the other three headphones. Um, and this correlated very well with the listeners, the subjective listeners who were listening to the playback over the, of the different headphones recorded over the head and torso simulator. And basically the program material did not seem to have a significant effect on the measured non-coherent distortion. So we got the best subjective correlation using this technique, even better than uh, looking at sine waves such as harmonic distortion. So it's a pretty powerful technique. All right, so let's talk about high-res uh, measurements and high-res uh, headphones. So for starters, I like to remind people that most musical instruments cannot play above 20 kilohertz. There simply is no musical content. The only exception might be um, a few instruments such as uh, the violin and, believe it or not, the female voice. Um, so most music recordings are also made with microphones that roll off above 20 kilohertz. So in a nutshell, there is basically not a lot of musical recording information above 20 kilohertz. Also, most humans cannot hear above 20 kilohertz. I know I certainly can't. Um, in general, the sensitivity to high frequencies deteriorate with age, typically diminishing above 15 kilohertz by age 40. So most uh, animals, believe it or not, with a, uh, some exception of chinchillas, cannot hear above 20 kilohertz. It's pretty interesting when we start to look at the different animal kingdom, which ones can actually hear above 20 kilohertz. But in any case, humans generally cannot. Why is that? Well, we have to look at the uh, anatomy of the human ear. And basically, if we look inside the uh, ear canal, we'll see the middle ear, which is depicted below, is got the three smallest bones in the human body, the malleus, incus, and stapes. And these bones actually transmit sound waves to vibration. First, 
the sound waves enter the ear canal and vibrate the tympanic membrane, otherwise known as the uh, eardrum. And then they get coupled and essentially amplified to the uh, cochlea via the oval window. In other words, we now have kind of a lever with an, uh, an impedance that matches the mechanical transfer. And that then gets transmitted into the cochlear membrane, which is, has sensors for detecting frequency and level. So what does that look like? So if we take the middle ear, including the cochlear membrane, and we unwrap it, we see that at high frequencies, which is right where the sound enters the cochlear membrane from the stapes, that this then gets transmitted to low frequencies as we travel across the basilar membrane. And you can see at the highest frequencies and at the lowest frequencies, the human ear is very unsensitive. Then in addition to that, we have these masking curves. And again, masking is essentially how the ear perceives frequency or the filters inside the human ear. And at the very highest and lowest frequencies, our ear filters get quite wide. So they're also not super sensitive at high frequencies. In fact, above 10 kilohertz, it's really uh, just an energy sensor. Um, and we generally cannot discriminate uh, high frequency resolution above 10 kilohertz. Why does this matter? So why do we want to exceed 20 kilohertz if we can't hear it and there's no musical content out there? Well, in order for a transducer to have a flat phase response out to 20 kilohertz, it requires a flat magnitude response out to 40 kilohertz. This is, by definition, at resonance, there is a 90 degree phase shift. So in other words, if we want to have zero degrees phase shift at 20 kilohertz, we got to extend our frequency range beyond 20 kilohertz just to get a very linear 20 kilohertz bandwidth. But in audible high frequency components, such as pictured below, we got to be a little careful that they don't beat down into the audio range. And what I mean by that is if we're reproducing, say, a headphone that goes out to 40 kilohertz, and there's some extraneous signal out at 30 and 33 kilohertz, it could even just be um, an alarm system, that that could um, beat down into the audio range of 3 kilohertz which will be quite audible. So that's another thing we have to consider is by extending the frequency range, we may be introducing essentially into modulation distortion. So again, why do we want to go above 20 kilohertz? Well, it turns out that the psychoacoustics of phase, as pointed out by John Boley at GN Rizan, that even quite a small mid-range phase nonlinearity can be audible on suitable chosen signals. Audibility is far greater on headphones than on loudspeakers because of the lack of room reflections. And ac simple acoustic signals generated anechoically display clear phase audibility on headphones. So in other words, that mid-range frequencies is extremely sensitive to phase and we want a flat phase response. The moment we introduce more complex signals or we introduce like a, a complex listening environment such as a symphony hall, then things, the phase starts to not be so significant. So even though it might be audible, um, we basically will not hear it as easily as listening to recorded vocal material, simpler material that's not going to have a lot of complexity. And this was found in uh, a AS paper written by Stanley Lipschitz and John van der Kroy and Mark Pocock. So it's a good paper to read if you're interested in this. So in this example, I measured um, the same reference headphones that we used for the distortion audibility comparison. And it's a Stax SR9 headphones, $5,000 headphones with a frequency response that goes from 5 to 42 kilohertz. As you can see, the ear coupler makes quite a difference. So if we use a standard B&K hats um, ear coupler, 
And by the way, that now they do have one that goes out to 20 kilohertz, but this is the older model. Um, we can see that the ear coupler is actually causing some attenuation in the blue curve at the high frequencies. So it's not really measuring accurately out to 40 kilohertz. What I recommend is that we use a flat plate coupler, as I've shown over here, with a quarter inch microphone that actually s extends beyond 20 kilohertz. Then we can see very precisely that there is signal coming out of the headphone all the way up to 40 kilohertz and beyond. But we can also see when measuring even these high-end headphones that if we introduce too high some frequencies above 20 kilohertz, such as 30 and 35 kilohertz, that again we can get intermodulation products beating down into audio range. And this is uh, quite audible. And if we crank up the level high enough, we'll see them come out of the noise floor. But typically, we shouldn't have signals out at 30 and 35 kilohertz so that at that high a level. But uh, clearly, this is a, a factor. If we had headphones that just rolled off steeply above 20 kilohertz, then of course, they would be heavily attenuated. So that ends my presentation for today. Um, thanks everyone for joining. I hope you all appreciate it. And I would really love to get your feedback. We would, we're going to send out a short survey that will allow you to download the link to these slides and video recording. We also, I'm going to answer um, anyone's questions that came up during the chat session. And I'll be happy to uh, stay online and answer those live. Thank you and goodbye.